Welcome into another edition of the Hops and Spirits podcast. We're going to be on the hoppy side tonight. Um, before we get in there, though, don't forget to check out our social media pages at Hop Spirits, all one word, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and even TikTok now. Um, although I'm not sure what I'm doing exactly there just yet. But you can keep up with all sorts of fun things, including our giveaways, highlights, our 60-second Give It a Try highlights, and so much more. That's at Hop Spirits, all one word, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and now TikTok. Because uh, that's what uh, I guess all the cool kids are doing these days. Uh, but tonight we're on the hoppy side of things, talking with Ballast Point, the crew from there and their research and development. And we have with me uh, Aaron Justice, the Director of Research and Development, and Chris Takeuchi. Did I say that right? Nice. Yep, perfect. All right, all right. <laughs> I had to practice that a little bit before we came on. It was a, a research and development brewer there as well, both based out of, uh, I believe, the Little Italy location. Is that correct? Correct. Awesome. Well, welcome in, Aaron and Chris. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, great to be here. Now, I always start things off with one tough question. It's a nice little icebreaker. Some people really do think it's a tough question because they just never think of these things. Uh, So for you all, my tough question is, what's your favorite snack food? Well, is, is beer a snack food? I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, what goes with the beer? <laughs> is that too easy? I, I thought your easy question was going to be uh, something like uh, Monty Python of the Holy Grail. What is your favorite color? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Green. No blue. Uh, French fries. Mm. I mean, it's not. I don't snack on it. It's just a. It's a. It's a terrible vice. My wife and I will order like a tray full of fries. And you know the the server will inevitably say you're not going to eat all this. You, you don't want you don't want the large. You know, get the small. It's enough for two people. And no, nope, we will eat the entire thing. So uh, that that's mine. Uh, I probably have too many snack foods that I like, but uh, I mean we're in San Diego. Chips and salsa. Um, I tend to do the same thing. I eat I, like oh it's a it's a snack before dinner, and then you end up eating a full meal of chips and salsa and feel terrible mm-hmm. afterwards. Uh, and I also find myself, uh, I got a five-year-old daughter and what kid doesn't like goldfish. Uh, I end up stealing a lot of her goldfish. Um, <laughs> she, but it's a good thing cause that, you know, it comes in like the, the gigantic gallon container now. So there's plenty to go around, but I do, I do like some goldfish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm right there with you with the, the chips. If I, especially if I'm out of like a Mexican restaurant, <laughs> um, sometimes I don't even need to eat, order a, an entree after that. Cause my wife and I have crushed like five things of <laughs> chips between the two of us and pretty much just any chip. I mean, I'm, I just I apparently can go through a whole bag and not realize it. So I might have a problem. I might, I might have a chip problem. <laughs> I mean, old but school, get, old school Doritos are still, I mean, I don't eat them very often, but when I do, I'm like, Oh, I shouldn't have eaten those. Cause now I want, <laughs> now I wish I had like a, a gigantic bag. <laughs> yeah. You could just have a bunch of party size bags of Doritos yep. around. Yep. And, <laughs> yep. That's by design. Now you yeah. got a map, just, just, bag fools for sure mm-hmm. <laughs> uh now now for for the the real show not not just snack foods although beer and snack foods go hand in hand i believe uh, for those that don't know what is a r d brewer what, what does a research and development brewer do <laughs> uh you want me to answer that <laughs> since that's, that's me <laughs> yeah you know what chris go for it all right um well, I mean, in, in at least at Ballast Point, uh, we focus on uh, small batch and, and pilot brewing, and we do a lot of, uh, I mean, research and development, just like it is any other company, we're, we're, we're testing things all the time. Um, we play with a lot of new raw materials, so the main four raw materials, uh, water, hops, small yeast, we mess around, we go do, we deep dive into all of them, um, and uh as Aaron always says, and this is a really good way to think about it, is you can't have an opinion about something when you're brewing in the brewing industry unless you've used it. Uh, so our goal is to have an opinion about everything, um, which is completely unachievable, but it's a good goal to target. Um, and it, it kind of keeps us focused on continually trying new stuff. Um, we'll try new, and it's not just raw materials, it's trying processes, um, fermentation profiles, just a lot of different methods um, for that are still ultimately ending up at uh, what is hopefully a delicious beer. Um, and so that's kind of what we're focused on. That's that's the research side. The development side is then 
uh, ideally taking something that comes out of our research side and then developing that further uh, with the goal of it being a package brand. Um, and so we're kind of, I would say, roughly evenly split between those at the moment. Um, we do a lot of education at Ballast Point too. We have a, an employee brig program that we, we kind of run through our Little Italy location. It's been on hiatus because of COVID because it involves groups of five or six employees coming down and brewing with us and we kind of teach them the nuts and bolts of the brewing process. Um, and so, yeah, we're doing a lot of that too. But uh, at the moment, yeah, it's, it's a lot of um, uh, exploration, research, um, hopefully not finding too many blind alleys uh, because those are a waste sometimes. Um, and then, yeah, developing or trying to develop new brands. I think conceptually you have to think size as well. So uh, our main production facility, uh, 300 barrel brew house. So when you're talking about like <clears throat> barrels in, in, in beer, uh, one barrel is 31 gallons or basically two kegs. So in one cycle, uh, we can do 600 kegs worth of beer uh, at our main production facility. Mm -hmm. Now our Little Italy R&D facility, uh, it's a five barrel system or 10 kegs per cycle. So in other words, it's uh, about 1 60th what our production cycle is. So it allows us to do a lot of small batch rapid fire uh, experiments. And uh, boy, do we do that. I mean, we, Chris, what, what was the, uh, one year we did 135 different beers. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, most maybe of them unique. Yeah, most of them are yeah, unique I recipes. Mean, pretty much unique recipes. Uh, one year I think we used uh, 50 or 60 different yeast strains. Mm -hmm. uh, this it's just crazy. I, I I'll be honest. Um, I never thought I'd work at a brewery like this one, where we're allowed to try anything and everything. So it's fun. <laughs> so like to, it's a, it's big it's a big sandbox for adults and we get to just mm -hmm. sit there and play playing it all day long so that uh, to sum up that's hey, no, hey nothing wrong with that now i'm guessing you get to also enjoy a few samples because i would just assume most people think you just sit around and, and drink beer all day <laughs> i mean it's a little more than that right <laughs> it, it is it is nice to uh have rapid gratification of your efforts uh if that's a, a good way to put it um, that That's you can, a good way to put it. yeah, you get to, I mean, I filtered a beer yesterday and we got to taste it. I mean, I tasted it yesterday afternoon, but then we tasted it again this morning. I mean, and you got to check carbonation to make sure that it's, you know, it's not, you know, it's, it's all quality checking, of course. <laughs> um, yeah. but, quality uh, control, quality yeah. control. Um, <laughs> there is, I mean, a lot of, a lot of what we do, I mean, I was joking, but there is a, a legitimate aspect to that where because of our scale, most of our. Uh, quality checks are sensory. So, I mean, we can measure carbonation. We don't actually utilize it very often because we, we, we've gotten pretty good at doing it to taste and we have our own, our own tastes and there's not really like a standard for anything that we make. Um, so we do, we do legitimately do a lot of, a lot of quality checks. Um, it's just the last one's the most fun because it's finished. <laughs> <laughs> and then now one of the ones that recently came out of your long the long process is the brothers gus um it's a part of you know the first year round addition uh, to the ballast point portfolio for a while and one's the we gus which is a hoppy lager and the other one is big gus which is an ipa and uh the very first one that i i figure we'll talk about is the we gus the hoppy lager uh, so what can you tell us about this and, and how that process started? Because it didn't just start yesterday. You guys have been working on this for a little while, right? Yeah, I don't goes, even remember. It goes what back to what we want to drink. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's what, yeah, I mean, that's we started, core, we put in, we yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we put in, we put in, sorry, we're talking over each other. Uh, I'm trying to think back of when, when the process actually started, because it was a while ago now. And then, of course, everything's fuzzy because of COVID. Um, but I mean, it was at least two years ago that we, we kind of had the idea of one thing that we, we really enjoy doing is kind of playing with, playing with people's senses a little bit and making a beer that, uh, tastes and smells like something unexpected. Um, and so we started, uh, as we do a lot, we get a lot of good ideas by, uh, drinking other people's beer. Um, 
whether it's the direct uh, inspiration from what we're drinking or we're just kind of, uh, you know, oiled a little bit and discussion is flowing freely. Yeah. Uh, we came up with the idea of doing uh, basically the palest beer that we could, but still make it hoppy. Um, and that's kind of where a lot of this came out of. We just decided, okay, let's, let's, let's from a technical brewing side, let's chase that uh, limiting of color and see how, how do we do that? So it was kind of like a cool intellectual exercise of from a recipe standpoint and from a process standpoint, how do you keep the color of a beer down as low as you can get it? Um, and then of course the, the trick is it looks like a, an American light lager. Um, and I've heard stories about people ordering it and it shows up at their table and they're like, did you pour me the wrong beer? And it's before they, and it's before they smelled it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, we wanted to make it so it looked like one thing, but then smelled, uh, smelled and tasted different. Um, and that, yeah, that whole process started at least two years ago now. And it is just it, brewing beers that you like to drink. I mean, that's kind of mm -hmm. our ongoing mantra within the company is, uh, you know, uh, do, do we, is this something that we even want to enjoy? And uh, we kind of have a, have a palate for uh, dry beers on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, so you think of like your West Coast IPA and then you have your San Diego IPA. So as you go farther West and farther South, beers keep getting drier and drier so when i say drier just less residual sugar and uh just kind of a a, a body that's not necessarily thin but just uh, enough that it's uh it's thirst quenching <laughs> for, for lack of lack of a better term so uh we, you know we we've been seeing a, a lot of hazies out there and i, I love hazy ipas and uh we wanted to also make something that wasn't a hazy IPA. So it, 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 this thing was kind of a, a marriage of, of, of a lot of ideas to just kind of um, have fun and also make something that people like to drink as well. So uh, that's kind of where it all starts. And this one uh, kind of hits the mark. Uh, we know that a lot of people are chasing calories uh, I'm not chasing calories, but I, I know that it's <laughs> important to some people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so uh, hence the the seltzer craze, and I, I will not go on to a too much of a big tangent on seltzers, uh, but but it is a thing, and uh, so we we also wanted to make something that could maybe hit that mark, but really ultimately we weren't targeting that. I don't think the. I don't think the three of us, there's another R&D brewer, I don't think the three of us sat down and thought, man, we really need to chase this trend. Uh, nothing, nothing's more lame than that. But with that said, one of the earliest iterations of this beer, uh, we did name definitely not a seltzer. Because <laughs> it's so low in color and it's so uh, crystal clear. It's... Uh, it, it's it, it, it's in that way, it's in that direction, but it's definitely a beer-flavored beer. It's got the four ingredients of, of beer. It's got malt, hops, water, yeast, and that's it. And it's just done in a way that makes it a, a, a product that, or a beer that's really enjoyable to drink. I'm, I'm trying to right now, and for those that are watching and not listening, you can see, I mean, you can pretty much see my hand right through the, the glass it's nice and clear <laughs> uh yeah and it's got some unique flavors because it's a hoppy lager you know i kind of get that herbal side to it um and it's got a very unique smell um you know so i why, why go with something kind of that clear that you can almost see through as a hoppy lager and and how 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 difficult was it to get almost see through on something with <laughs> with that kind of taste uh I'm guessing that took a little bit of research. <laughs> yeah. Again, sure. I mean, I, I think, uh, we, <laughs> yeah, we were, we were, uh, again, as I said, when we started talking about it, kind of a, an interesting exercise in, in chasing, uh, low color. Um, and you know, you do that by selecting your malt properly and you can vary some things on as you're brewing it. Um, and yeah, just sort of like, 
basically utilizing the skills at your disposal to uh, achieve a target that you wouldn't ordinarily when you're designing a beer. Um, and again, I, I mean, I think it was the first one that we made, um, we were kind of targeting, let's go low color, but make it aggressively hoppy. And then from that initial one, it kind of split off into, into the two brothers. Um, and, uh, this one, this one, that, that herbal note that you're talking about, it's, it's, uh, it's dry hopped with, uh, Hollertown middle fruit and, uh, Northern Brewer. So they're, they're German, uh, German hops, um, that have a, have an herbal, uh, kind of lemony, lemony character to them. Um, mm-hmm. so that was a choice too, to kind of make it distinct from an American hop profile, which is going to have more of that pine and citrus or a Southern hemisphere. It's more tropical. Um, and, uh, yeah, again, it was, it was. I still think of it as like trying to trick the eye a little bit, to where uh, a beer that's that pale, your brain tells you it shouldn't be hoppy because it's so light. <laughs> yeah, that's not. I could see where people go. Hey, that's not what I ordered mm-hmm. without without doing the sniff and the, the first drink. Now, once right. you taste the drink, it's okay. That makes sense now, but my brain's still not sure what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, I mean, cons- you definitely. Conceptually- Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, conceptually, when we had developed this beer, uh, we we brewed uh, what four or five different vari- uh, uh, versions of it with different hops, and then let the employees uh, of Ballast Point taste them and, and rate them and choose their favorite one. And this is the one that the employees chose. Uh, we we were laughing because you know we thought they're going to choose the one with the most bombastic hops. And instead, they kind of uh, everyone chose the the one that was a little bit more delicate and uh, nuanced. Uh, but it it really comes through. It's, it's really enjoyable. Uh, the hoppiness is enough there to, to add a little bit of mouthfeel, and uh, it's it's got it's got a lot of flavor. You know, it, it's not it's not your quintessential light lager. And when you're talking about clarity, a lot of uh, color will come from the malt. Uh, and it also is protein. So a lot of what uh, makes hazy IPAs hazy are, is the high protein content that uh, brewers try to get to develop that haze. We went the opposite direction and tried to remove the protein. So we, we added a, a decent amount of sugar in, instead of malt to kind of lower that color and um, make it a little bit more crystal clear. So it's fun, and you know when I say we're adding sugar, I know a lot of people think, oh, that that's terrible. You you don't want sugar. This is prior to fermentation. Everything's fermented out. This thing is fermented to zero uh, gravity, which means there's almost almost zero uh, residual sugars. So uh, in that in that vein, it's um, it is a low calorie beer. Twelve mm-hmm. ounces is going to be of Wegus is going to be about ninety five calories. Which is insanely low for beer. Yeah, yeah. Well, and one that actually packs a little bit of flavor. You know what I mean? Like, because I've had many under 100 calorie beers. Some are good, but they, <laughs> dude, there's a difference. There's a difference. Unfortunately, there's a difference uh, when you're talking about the quote unquote athletic beers these days. <laughs> yeah, beers. yeah. <laughs> That's good. Uh, but, but, you know, you guys were kind of touching on this. You know, you guys. Brew now. Do you brew a hundred or so different recipes every year, trying to find different things, or do you kind of work on the recipes and then brew maybe half of that? How, how does the, that process go when you're kind of thinking this up? I mean, is it a recipe first, kind of like you do with cooking, or are you actually cooking and then writing down down the recipe? I'll let you tackle that one, Chris. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we we always have a recipe design in advance. Um, and we, it's, it's really the only way that, uh, in my opinion, that you can replicate anything. If you haven't, if you haven't written it down in advance and then made notes, um, if you've had to tweak something, uh, it still gives you the base, like the foundation that you need, that you're building on, and then you can optimize or improve it from there. Um, yeah, there's, there isn't like a throw a whole bunch of stuff in there and, and take notes as you go. Um, everything is well laid out from how much water is used at every given step. Uh, weights of hops, weights of malt, everything is already kind of pre-calculated. Um, most beers that we brew, uh, there's a, there's a, it's not like we have a, a 
a portfolio or a folder of recipes and we just pick, okay, let's brew this one today. <laughs> um, it's more, it's way more short term than that. So um, like there's a, there's, I'm doing, I'm brewing something on Wednesday and I wrote the recipe today. Um, and we, I mean, we already had stuff on hand, so I already knew where it was going, but um, it doesn't take very long at this point. I mean, um, all three of us in R and D are, are very, very experienced recipe writers um, to where, you know, for something like an IPA, I'm pretty confident that I can put a pretty good IPA, West Coast IPA to re recipe together um, based on on hand raw materials in about five minutes. Um, and it'll probably come out pretty well. Um, so yeah, there's there's a, I guess the point is there's always a plan. The recipe's already pre-exists uh, before you brew it. Um, and how far in advance of the brew you write it is, it's variable. Um, but uh, there are times though where you sit down and you just kind of have a wild idea and you write a recipe for it and it just kind of disappears into the into the server um, because it was just a wild idea and you threw it out there and, and it just doesn't fit into the schedule for some reason or it doesn't fit into what we're trying to do at that given time. Um, but that doesn't happen very often. Usually the, the recipe writing is very directed. <clears throat> and, and then how long does it take, you know, from, from that idea to maybe go into the quote unquote market, whether that's just some kegs, um, you know, at the, at, at the brewery or even, you know, like we Gus and big Gus, which was a couple of years to cans and distribution. It just depends on the beer. I mean, it, the thing is when, when you, once you actually commercialize, uh, especially on a larger scale, it's all about, uh, getting the packaging. That always takes uh, a decent amount of time because, you know, we got our cans and they're, they have their artwork and so it gets really complex uh so yeah even just from uh, the inception of an idea i mean we, we we do at the very least we have a a catalog of beers that are ready to scale um i chris how many do you think we have a, a few hundred several hundred maybe a couple thousand yeah, and that, if there, if we haven't written a recipe for it, we can in pretty short order. <laughs> and we probably pretty much can pretty do it in short order, yeah. Yeah, yeah so uh, I, I guess uh, the recipes are ready, and we can always tweak it here or there if we find a new ingredient or a new process. I mean, uh, you know, a, a perfect example of, of something that we're doing right now, we're kind of refining how we do Belgian beers. And this latest round, we decided to kind of make it a mixed culture fermentation where we're using uh, traditional Saccharomyces brewer's yeast and we're blending in uh, wild Britannomyces, Britannomyces yeast. And we found that that really gives us a, a, a flavor and a body that we really enjoy. So now we're, we're thinking, okay, well, this is, we're, 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 we're more happy with our Belgian beers but they're not perfect because then what we'll do is grab a couple of commercial, uh, uh, you know, versions of that and even some historical popular ones from uh, Belgium. And then we'll do it uh, blind and line them up and taste our beer to, to other people's beer. And uh, sometimes we, we don't choose our beer. We say, oh, my gosh, this one's uh, really amazing. And then we think, OK, that wasn't our beer. <laughs> why? Why does it taste better? And the, the three of us will sit there and, and overanalyze beer. Some, sometimes some people may not enjoy drinking beer with us because we're sitting there just analyzing the hell out of these beers. Uh, but it's because we, we, we love it. We love what we do and it's, it's fun. Uh, if I wasn't getting paid to do this, I would still be overanalyzing beer and, and homebrewing. So uh, it, it is fun. It's fun to, to taste others beer, other people's beer. That's where we get a lot of inspiration is other breweries. Uh, it, it's nothing's more fun than going to another brewery and, and being inspired. So uh, that's super important with R and D as well. Well, and I was gonna say, I'm guessing too. Once you actually uh, get it, get it all right, uh, whatever that process is, and you actually get to kind of send it on its way, you know, send it out into the into the real world. That has to be a pretty good feeling uh, when other people get to enjoy it and. And it's you know flying off the shelf or or out of the tap. Yeah, that's always fun. I mean, it's it's always nice. Like uh, where where our brew house is situated within our brewery. If you're standing on the platform, 
uh, one of the retail coolers is right right down below, and you can see, and it's it's it is kind of cool. I mean, it's seeing people grabbing them off the shelf, uh, something that we that we piloted. Um, I mean, it's nice to know that we you know aren't just kind of isolated in our little bubble making our stuff for the te- for the tasting rooms. Like we're we're having a positive impact on the on the company at large, and you know um, and having people take take beer that you made home to drink it. I mean, they don't have to pick our beer and they have, you know? Um, so it's always a, a good confidence booster. <laughs> like well, like, we're doing something but, right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. We, uh, we, we always have fun. Uh, every year we have what's called a victory at sea day, be- uh, or, I'm sorry, victory at sea day, which is, uh, our Imperial Porter victory at sea. Uh, the Sunday before Christmas, we will release, 12 different versions of the same beer so we get to spice them kind of have fun and do all these different types of beers and uh so you know for for some years we'll do something like uh ginger snap or we'll do other things that have flavors that uh people are very excited about uh and then sometimes we do things that um we kind of mess with people so uh we made one with uh grim uh, the uh, Grim Reaper, or, or not the Grim Reaper? Is it what is it called? The uh, uh, Carolina Reapers. The Carolina Reapers. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, we put Carolina Reapers, the the hottest pepper uh, on on Earth, at least for now, uh, into the beer. And you know what? Some people probably didn't like that. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the, the two of us love mm-hmm. it because the thing is, when you put chilies in a beer, especially when they're superbly hot. Uh, you get uh, two things. You get uh, that endorphin rush from the peppers, but you also get an endorphin rush from the, the high alcohol content uh, because we put it into a barrel-aged version uh, of this beer, so it was about 12 ABV. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> All right. So, you know, you have like four ounces of it, and it, it is uh, it's life-enhancing. <laughs> hey, you ready to just hey. like sprint down the road? <laughs> hey, I'm okay you're you're kind of excited, yeah. Yeah, it's like an you're, energy you're drink. To, yeah, you're ready to <laughs> wrestle a bear or something yeah. like that. It's, uh, it's pretty intense. Uh, now, now the other brother of, of the Gus is, is the uh, is Big Gus. He, he's Thought an I heard IPA. Open. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, I was, I figured figured right. he needed to be you know invited to the party as well. Um, no, as as normal, it might take me a while because I stink at pouring beer, despite this being kind of a part time job for me. And They're highly hobby. carbonated. Um, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Oh, yeah. It doesn't matter for me. You, you can ask my <laughs> wife. I'm really bad. Um, but this is a you know an IPA. It it you know the the wee gus is uh, you know under 100 calories. It comes in at 4.2 percent ABV. Um, this one is 6.5 percent. Um, under 150 calories, though, so kind of more on the athletic or you know healthier side, so to speak, for for an IPA, um, and it's a 50 IBUs. Uh, what what is this one? Why does how does this one? I guess differ. Obviously, it's a different beer uh, style, but how does it differ from from We Gus? And how did you guys come up with this one? Because it's it's a clear IPA, and you guys went away from the hazy craze that's going on right now, which is hazy to the point you can't even see through them anymore. Uh, at a lot of places. <laughs> yeah, this one, this one uh, again, it went through the, the rigor of a, um, a series of, of tests uh, where we made four different versions and had, had the employees pick the favorite, and this was the one that won. Um, and the design on this one was to basically make it look the same, or at least very close to Wegas color-wise and clarity-wise, um, but have the hop profile be pretty different. So this one uh, is all American hops, um, and it's just sort of more aggressively hop forward, uh, but without yeah, without being um, even as full bodied as, as a West Coast IPA, not nearly as bitter. To have it be more kind of uh, refreshing or drinkable or quaffable or whatever word you want to use, um, and still so still have the hallmarks of a of an IPA, a West Coast IPA, um, but be different. And then also it has hallmarks of a hazy IPA, and that the bitterness is a little softer and a little lower than a, than a West Coast IPA or an American IPA. Um, and it's all kind of uh, late edition hops, so you get you get a lot of aroma and flavor out of them, and not quite as much bitterness. Um, so we kind of took different pieces of all of them um, of of those concepts and just kind of put them together. Uh, but I guess the primary difference between the two is that Wegus is a lager, and 
that Gus is an, is an ale. Um, f- kind of a foundational difference. <laughs> and it's but, got but an you... ale strain that we really like for IPA. Uh, a lot of people are really big on uh, juicy, whatever whatever that means. Uh, <laughs> aren't all fruits, don't they have a certain amount of juice in them? I always wonder that. Uh, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, but I think it's more of this like tropical fruit uh, uh, element. So you, your, your mangoes, your pineapples. Uh, so a lot of people are, are enjoying hops that have that. And there are yeast strains that also boost those characters. So uh, the yeast will release these uh, these esters, these fruity esters, these aromatic compounds, and uh, this one that we chose for this beer, and for a lot of our IPAs that we're kind of making right now, including hazies, is this Irish uh, yeast strain uh, that's really uh, expressive. Uh, I'm I'm smelling it right now, and and it is really accentu- accentuating this beer. Mm-hmm. And uh, the hops aren't from Germany. These these are from uh, the Pacific Northwest of the United States. So it's it's got mosaic. Uh, it's got a hop that we've really been loving lately, cashmere, and uh, Amarillo hops. And Amarillo we actually source direct from from the farmer. Uh, it's, it's a hop that's in uh, Sculpin. So we we buy a lot of it every year. So uh, just, just a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. So, uh, yeah, we, we have uh, a farm in, in Yakima, at Virgil Gamash Farms, VGF Farms. Uh, we source our amarillos from them. Uh, we handpick them every year. Well, not handpick them. Not say that. <laughs> so, so you're not that, out that there would, actually <laughs> working. That, that would take a long time. Yeah. Uh, but we, we select them. We go there and we, we have a, a, a selection from uh, as many lots as we, as we want, or a, a decent amount of lots. And we choose which ones we like the most. So uh, th- those are the hops that are in this beer, and they kind of uh, are harmonious and kind of add this uh, nice tropical, juicy uh, character to the beer. Yeah, it's it's real interesting because I'm, I'm I'm coming around to the IPA. It's weird that I do a podcast that talks about beer and, and bourbon and not be a huge IPA fan. Um, now sours and, and lagers, all that I'm I'll be first in line for. It. Uh, IPAs, though, I'm coming around to. And this one's kind of nice because you mentioned it, Chris. It's kind of, it doesn't come at you real crazy at the beginning, but mm-hmm. you get that little bit of a bitter hoppiness on the back end. And it, I, that's, that to me is an approachable IPA. Mm-hmm. You know, like anyone can walk up to the bar and feel like, well, I don't know if I like that. This is something that they could ease their way into some of the other ones because mm-hmm. it's, it's got some of those, you know, fruity characteristics, but nothing's like overwhelming. Um, it's just a, a, a nice pour, you know. It's super carbonated too. Uh, I, I'm I'm burping on this one. Uh, both <laughs> of them are. But you know the the thing is, the, uh, uh, you know the, the body because it's so dry, it needs uh, something there to kind of counter or just balance that out. So, yeah, hops can add body, and and carbonation certainly helps as well. That's an ingredient a lot of people don't talk about. Is, is is gas or, or carbonation and that we, we've learned can really have a huge impact on flavor and how uh, flavors are expressed in beer so this one is really spritzy and again definitely is not a seltzer <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say the carbonation just just got me there uh, just a second ago mm-hmm. uh, now now for you all you guys have worked there at, um, at Ballast Point for for a while now What's it like working for, for Ballast Point? You know, you guys are celebrating 25 years. I know for those that have been there for a while, you guys have gone through some changes um, in terms of ownerships and whatnot, and you're kind of back to that independent uh, feel again uh, with Kings and Convicts taking taking over recently. What's it like working from there at a place that started literally out of a, a home brew mart? You know, I mean, and it's, it's doing some big things. Oh boy! Yeah, you go I, ahead. You know, we have I, different I, perspectives on this, so <laughs> yeah, we had well, just because we've had a different kind of paths, I think. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I, for me, um, so I, I was first introduced to Ballast Point uh, when I was living in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, this is over. This is almost 12, 14 years ago. Uh, I had Sculpin for the first time and absolutely loved it. Uh, at, at the time, we were also getting Green Flash and Stone out on the East Coast, and I really thoroughly enjoyed their 
IPAs as well. Uh, they were phenomenal. And uh, at the time, I, I, I was working in television. I was a TV meteorologist. So I, I did that for 13 years. But uh, I was homebrewing at the time, and I, I knew that I wanted to change careers. And uh, packed up my bags and moved to, to San Diego. And the first place that I applied to was Ballast Point. And luckily, uh, the timing was right, and they hired me on. Uh, I was washing kegs uh, for, uh, for, for minimum wage and happily doing that. And uh, at the time, we were producing 20,000 barrels a year. Uh, and then, you know, at, at peak pr production, uh, four years later, we're doing about 420,000 barrels a year. So you, you can kind of do the math. It, it was extreme growth. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was a, when I first started, uh, I, I was the 30th employee. And uh, at our largest Ballast Point, we were pushing almost 1,000 employees. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't even – we were moving at such a, a, a fast pace, uh, my head was spinning. I, I, I couldn't even tell you what it was like back then because I just – it's hard to remember. <laughs> Uh, it was just fast. It was really, it was really, it, you, you walk in, uh, put your boots on and you would not know what to expect for that day. And inevitably it was a shit show, <laughs> <laughs> an organized shit show. So, uh, but you know, it was fun. Everyone that, that, uh, you know, worked for Ballast Point then and, and even now uh, and through the years, have been extremely passionate. That that has never gone away. Everyone cares so much that you know we're sitting there as we're working, talking about beer, and and if, if if it wasn't enough, right after we clock out, we go to the tasting room, and then for another hour we're still talking about beer, and having arguments, friendly arguments, and and you know really taking this deep dive into this weird world that we're in so uh yeah i i had a, I had a time where i got to actually work at homebrew mart i worked at homebrew mart for about a year as a specialty brewer uh that was really exciting uh just because you could feel the history in it uh, you can feel it in the walls at mm -hmm. homebrew mart uh, it's really got a special feel to it and it's not even just the history of Ballast point it's kind of the history of, of of San Diego beer uh, because so many people have walked through those doors as home brewers and eventually became professional brewers here in San Diego and across the country. So uh, I'll quit, I'll quit yapping. Uh, I'll let Chris talk about his, uh, his perspective as well, but uh, things have changed, but uh, they, they haven't. Uh, a lot has stayed the same. Um, a lot of the same people just caring about beer. Uh, that's the way I see it. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would. I'll try to bring it back to Aaron's last point because it's I, it's totally true. Um, but like I I started uh, in 2014 after working at a at a smaller place um, in Poway called Lightning Brewery. Um, it was kind of out in north the northeast part of the county, um, and. Uh, worked there for about nine months as a, as a brewer. Um, and it was a very kind of, uh, traditionally directed, uh, German brewery, like German style breweries making Hefeweizens that were, uh, Hefeweizens and Pilsners were the main two, the main two brands there. And the, the brew days there were extremely long cause everything had a, had a, an extended, uh, brew schedule. Um, cause they were made by really traditional German methods. And so when I left there and walked into Ballast Point, um, it was just a total, like, I walk sort of the same thing where Aaron said, but this was like exactly where I started, where you walk in, you put your boots on and you have no idea what's going on. Uh, but in a good way, cause it means like it, it was a, it was a grind, like walking in there and suddenly it's like 11 hours of basically like at a half sprint around, around the brewery for a full shift where you're just completely destroyed, uh, fatigue wise at the end of the day. Still find time to go have a shifty and like have a random chat with the CFO on the patio because he's there having a beer too. Um, but it was just it it, uh, it was a good initiation into like this is what uh, really explosive growth in craft brewing is like um, in a 
in a facility that's probably a little bit too small for it. Um, but it was kind of a good testing ground. Um, and I think a lot, as Aaron said, a lot of people came through Homer Mart. There's a lot of professional brewers too that came through our Scripps facility who got kind of trained on, on brewing methods in a very tight space um, and constantly keeping your eye on like uh, how we're, we're drinking the finished goods at the end of the day. So let's make sure that we're doing our part in the process to make them killer. Um, and I learned really early on and it's never changed is that the one thing that we, uh, those of us who have been there for a while and it's the same, it is a lot of the same people. Uh, one thing we're very familiar with is, is turmoil. I mean, it's kind of where like the, the explosive growth was, was, uh, incredible and, and, uh, it was awesome for the company and it was completely turbulent. I mean, it was just chaos all the time. Um, and everything that's happened since then is just a different kind of chaos. Uh, and I think we're all really good now kind of rolling with the punches. There's just, it's still the same thing. You come in, you put your boots on, and you don't really know what to expect. Um, but that doesn't really, you know, you get familiar with it. It doesn't change your focus. You, you put your head down and you work and you work with the people around you. And then at the end you have a beer on the patio with people and the goal is still the same. Um, and yeah, as Aaron said, it's, it's a lot of the same core group of people who went through that explosive growth and then have gone through everything since then. Uh, and the eye is still always on the prize. It's, it's make, make the beer that you want to drink at the end of the day. Yeah, and you guys seem to, seem to be doing that, that pretty well. What, how, how did you guys, like, because both of you were not going into brewing. Uh, well, nowadays, nowadays it's kind of a thing. You can actually go into brewing at school. You can learn. Uh, you can do the same thing with whiskey, bourbon, all that stuff. As I like to tell people all the time, that was not on my career thing in high school. I don't ever remember that being a thing at high school. <laughs> uh, you know, for for you, Aaron, you were yep. you were a meteorologist. How do you just wake up? I mean, uh, for and in, in a big if you were in Richmond, that's a big size market. You were you were moving your way up. You didn't. I guess you didn't want to go be on Good Morning America. You wanted to go homebrew and then do something a little different. I mean. How does it, how do you just wake up one day and go? Ah, I'm tired of predicting the weather. I'm gonna go make beer. I mean, TV TV is is a grind. I mean, it, it's it's hard. You know, you if you want to move up in your career, you have to move. Mm-hmm. So yeah. by that meaning, you're jumping market to market to market, going from one bigger market to another one to another one. And, and don't get me wrong, I actually. I loved living in Richmond. It was actually painful to leave there because I had so many friends. Such a great Virginia is such a great state, uh, but I also didn't see myself retiring in television. I just I, I didn't see it. And uh, you know, you're you're signing these two-year contracts, two-year contract, two-year contract, two-year contract. That's that's a hard life, and I I just didn't see myself uh, in my fifties. Uh, worrying every two years about my whether or not I was going to be employed. So uh, it was a pretty easy decision. I mean, it was kind of a eureka moment because I, I, I wanted to go into to the food industry. I wanted to go to culinary school because I loved making things. And it wasn't just like uh, I, I tried like dabbling in art. I'm terrible at art, like just <laughs> laughable. Uh, no, so no, no, I, no. I was like, no. Nope. You, you're, you're an artist. You're an artist that just <laughs> makes beer. Your medium is beer. That's all. <laughs> yeah, there That's you good go. good way to think about uh, it. When yeah. A, yeah, when a five-year-old can draw better than you. Uh, but no, I, I I learned early on as, as a kid. I was like, no, nope, art's not for me. But I, I, I love like creativity, finding ways to be, to be creative. Um, so... I had my science degree. A science degree helps with brewing significantly. Uh, so you need that left brain aspect to better understand uh, brewery calculations and stuff like that. But it's not absolutely necessary, but it's helpful. Uh, physics, I mean, I, I studied physics in college, so I mean, really, the, it was the physics department at University of Kansas uh, that I got my degree from. So, uh, and Chris will talk too, because he's, he's a scientist as well. So. Uh, mm-hmm. But, but, you know, uh, brewing is the perfect marriage of, of, of that right brain creativity with left brain science and engineering and math. Uh, so I realized, screw culinary school. Uh, I was a home brewer and I remember just smelling wort and, it, you know, the, the, it was boiling on my, on my stove. 
and it was a eureka moment. I said, I, I would be happy smelling this for the rest of my life. And uh, I don't care what I get paid. Uh, I'm just going to do it. So, and I knew that beer is, is always going to be around. Mm-hmm. It always has. It always will. So uh, it was a calculated decision, but it was also some, something that I just, it was passion. And I kind of just jumped in with both feet. Um, it was, it was scary. I moved to San Diego and I was, I was unemployed. And, uh, you know, for two weeks I was living out of a tent, uh, at a campsite, uh, out on, in, in East County and, uh, trying to find a job. So that was kind of fun. <laughs> hey, like, like all good, you know, drinking story, you know, drinking escapades, it comes with a great story, you know, camping out to get a job. Uh, and, and for and for you, Chris, I, I mean, you you grew up in Colorado, right? Yep. Um, and then you you went to go to grad school in San Diego, just to um, what was it, oceanography or, or something uh, like that. I, I have a I have a doctorate in geophysics. Oh, okay. <laughs> he, he's the smart one in the group. Okay. Uh, so, but I mean, so because you were doing grad school and then at mm-hmm. night doing uh, the kind of a brewing school that UC San Diego, I believe, mm-hmm. had, right? Yeah, so it was it was kind of a an interesting confluence of timing where where I I moved out yeah I moved out for grad school, uh, drank a lot of San Diego beer in in grad school because uh, grad students hey, you're old tend enough. to yeah. yeah grad students like tend to like to drink a fair amount because you study all day and you gotta you gotta kind of cut loose a little bit um, and so I was I was kind of getting familiar after moving from Colorado which already had like I, I lived in Boulder there's a there was a thriving craft beer scene. Uh, mainly built on like New Belgium and Odell. Um, I still love Odell 90 shilling to this day, um, even though I had some over indulgence uh, <laughs> indulgences with it back in uh, college. It's great beer. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, but there's there was already a thriving craft beer market uh, in in Colorado, and then when I moved out here, uh, it was uh, kind of in the same phase, maybe a little bit ahead in terms of growth, um, and yeah, had had. Uh, had Sculpin uh, right right after my stipend payment came in because you could afford it at that point because um, it was kind of expensive. Uh, <laughs> it was the expensive the expensive IPA, um, and then I was drinking a lot of Big Eye because it was it was cheaper and it was like I was kind of learning about uh, IPA at that point. And then I finished grad school and kind of had the same thought process as Aaron uh, as kind of looking into my future in in what I was doing. Um, and a lot of uh, what you do after you finish grad school as a postdoctoral student, you're bouncing around from place to place um, for, uh, could be four, five, ten years, kind of getting your resume built up so that you can get a, get a professorship somewhere. And I kind of recognized that that wasn't for me. And I had a buddy from grad school actually email me and said, UCSD starting a brewing program. Like, just, I know you're kind of like, uh, you're interested kind of because I'd homebrewed really poorly. Um, through grad school with him mainly and he's like he's like just check this out and I was like yeah hey, it's night it's night school I'll, I'll check it out it was the it was just starting so I signed up for it and got into the first cohort um, Chris Hotz the other R&D brewer was also in the first cohort there's a whole bunch of people who, who are in that first one who are in in the craft brewing community in San Diego now um, and what happened was the first quarter of that of that program uh, I had three courses. Um, it was a raw materials course, um, a work production course, and then kind of an overarching, like an overall in- introductory course. And they were taught by uh, Yusuf Cherney, who is the former head brewer at Bowles Point and now the head distiller at Cutwater Spirits. Uh, Mitch Steele, who is the currently at that time the head brewer at Stone and is now the head brewer at New Realm in, in, uh, in Atlanta and Virginia and various other spots. And then Lee Chase, who used to be the head brewer at Stone um, and runs kind of a little brew pub thing uh, called Automatic Brewing in, in San Diego. So these were like three kind of historical heavyweights mm-hmm. in the San Diego craft, craft brewing community. And they were taking their time to teach a bunch of like brand new kind of idiot first year students, um, kind of to give them an introduction. And uh, it took about a week of that being like, that spoke to me the fact that that a guy like Mitch Steele who has worked at AB InBev is like a, an incredible brewer uh, one of the best teachers that I've ever had was taking his own time to teach 
like that that speaks a lot about the community of brewing um and that kind of sank in for me and i i applied for a job at at lightning uh, about a week later and just left like i just left what i was doing and as aaron said jumped in with both feet uh and realized really quickly you can't not jump in with both feet uh when you get your first brewing job because you're washing kegs um (laughs) i mean you're starting out you're starting out doing uh, manual labor for eight, yeah. eight to ten to twelve hours a day, um, and there's nothing gl- glamorous about it at all. You're you're just cleaning kegs over and over and over. And you know, when I was in grad school, I did a lot of work on on not a lot of work, but a, a fair amount of work on research vessels um, going to sea, and just really enjoyed the manual labor aspect of it because it was such a departure from doing research all the time. Um, and found that I, I just realized this is more, it's giving me more gratitude and more appreciation and more enjoyment than the actual research is. So maybe I should actually kind of chase that. And yeah, and again, another thing that Aaron said, it's a perfect hybrid of science and creativity. Um, and that, it just worked. Um, kind of just came together. <clears throat> I, I love stories like that because a lot of, a lot of, folks whether it's in the distilling industry or the brewing industry have very similar stories that are now doing some big things and i always love that they're just like no i wanted something different wanted something that i'm going to enjoy going to work every day go home with a sense of accomplishment and want to go back the next and i love that i also love that you kind of touched on it chris and i think this does a lot for both just the, the the alcohol industry in general for the most part from what i've gathered is there's just a lot of good people that are always willing to help. Um, you don't see that in every industry. You see it in some, but not not every industry. And I think that that, that has to make it a, a fun thing to do as well, where you get to hang out with quote unquote competitors at the end of the day, and, and you guys can talk and be friends. Yeah, I think there's there's a uh, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say I think there's there's a lot of value in uh, your second career. Um, maybe more than your first one because it's a choice. Like a lot of times your first one is you kind of wander into something out of, out of, out of high school or out of college or whatever whatever route you're on. You may not make a, make a, a firm decision at any point in there, um, but your second career, there's a, there's a very distinct choice involved in it because you're usually leaving something else. <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, as you said, uh, when, there's, when there's a lot of good people around um, and they're willing to give their time to help and to teach, uh, I think it kind of places a, a bit of a burden on you as a as somebody who's coming up behind them to kind of continue that. Um, like that's an important thing to keep because um, I think if you lose if you lose that, you've lost a big piece of what makes craft beer craft beer. Is that is that kind of inclusivity and and willingness to help and and be open about stuff. Sorry, I cut you off, Aaron. Oh, I, I'm just enjoying, uh, I'm just enjoying this big guts. No, uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think, uh, also with, with R and D, um, we're, we're an open book, uh, when it comes to just, uh, the community and, uh, you know, so we, we'll do a lot of presentations and whenever we find stuff, uh, it's not proprietary. Uh, we, we share everything and, and we make sure to go to conferences and uh, present our results and and give back. That's really important to us. And it's it's always well received and people uh, say, man, I never thought of that. Or they'll say, hey, uh, uh, let's collaborate and let's work together and let's uh, come up with something new. And and it is. It, it's a great community to be in. Uh, I love going to conferences. I can't wait to start going back to them again because uh, virtual is totally lame. Um, one, one thing that's amazing about beer, I mean, here we are, we're socializing, right? And, and this is great, don't get me wrong, but uh, beer is that wonderful social liquid, for lack of a better term, where uh, it, get, it brings people together. And mm-hmm. I really look forward to just being able to see people in person again uh, very very soon. So uh, I'm, I'm fully vaccinated, <laughs> so <laughs> we're getting there. 
uh, <laughs> slow, slowly but surely. And, and my last mm-hmm. question for for y'all uh, is is kind of what what's maybe next uh, for for Ballast Point that you guys are working on that you can talk about on a recorded podcast. <laughs> That might be a, a good, my last tough question, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what we're what we're not working on. Uh, we're always developing something new that's hoppy. Mm-hmm. So you know, don't be surprised if uh, we release uh, at least one or two uh, new IPAs. Uh, that goes without saying. Um, what other projects are we going on? Yeah, we we. I, 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 I mean, know during... double IPAs. Yeah, during sure. during uh, during the the shutdowns out here, because uh, we we weren't moving quite as much volume as we usually do, obviously because the tasting rooms are closed. Mm-hmm. Uh, we our our kind of response to that was, well, we need to make beers that take longer to make, so we're not sending them out quite as often. So we went pretty heavy into lager into lager lager territory and really um, kind of buckled down and dove into like how do we really want to make like a I mean a really really good lager. Um, the scalability of those is, is maybe not ideal because they the, we take a really long time to make them <laughs> um, <laughs> because we're not really under time pressure. Mm-hmm. But uh, I mean, we've yeah we've got a bunch of those kind of in in the quiver. Um, I I guess my my answer is I I don't know I don't know what the we don't currently have a project that we're working on specifically um, and uh, we're. But but it all for us it always just comes back to well whatever whatever the company chooses or wants to scale up whatever our customers want us to scale up uh, we have a recipe for it mm-hmm. um, so whatever comes at us we're we're ready to roll with it <laughs> and those those shutdown loggers uh, sat in the tank for about 40, 50 days mm-hmm. those things were phenomenal uh, loggers are called logger for a reason they're they're supposed to be stored. Uh, and condition long conditioning time and those were phenomenal are they commercially viable eh, maybe we can make it happen uh, did they taste great hell yes they did mm-hmm. uh, but we we continue to refine our, our lagering processes uh, so uh, that that that's one thing that I could see uh, coming down the pipeline as well and uh, you know we have competitions start getting ready for competition seasons uh, right around the corner. So we're already starting to brew competition beers. Uh, one of our uh, passion projects uh, between the two of us, uh, Chris and I, is, is working on um, a smoked lager. That uh, w- uh, when we went to Germany to uh, go to an award ceremony, this is in Bamberg. Uh, we we drank the smoked lager at Schlenkerla. And uh, life-altering experience, and we have been forever chasing that flavor ever since we had those pints in 2016. Yeah, so, four years uh, ago. <laughs> hey. Yeah, so that that's uh, we brewed that last week, and uh, I'm really big into uh, imperial stouts and export stouts, so brewed that about a week ago as well. So th- that's what's kind of in our tank. Uh, uh, we just filtered a. a basically a Belgian double. Uh, the ABV is about nine. Uh, and that was one of those beers that had a mixed culture. Uh, that one, uh, I may crack after these beers. So. <laughs> That's kind of what we're brewing right now. Uh, and we do a bunch of like barrel fermentations as well. Uh, so those will start to, to blend out and release, uh, at least at our tap rooms here in San Diego. That so sounds- that's kind of what we're doing right now. Sounds like you guys got, got plenty to work on because that's, that's just what you do every day. Uh, a little bit of research and development. Uh, well, <laughs> well, Chris, Aaron, I, I really appreciate it. I, I enjoyed getting to, to try the, the Brothers Gus. Um, I'm going to say I, I really enjoyed Big Gus more, a little bit more than we Gus. Um, and like I said, I'm not a big IPA. Well, I'm becoming an IPA fan. I should, I should clear it. I'm becoming an IP, IPA fan. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, like I said, I, I really enjoyed those, really enjoyed this conversation. A lot of fun. Uh, like I said, I appreciate you guys taking the time. Our pleasure. Great. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that was so much fun. I really appreciate Aaron and Chris hopping on uh, to talk about kind of the research and development side of things. Um, you know, that's where they're based out of at Ballast Point. But also just to talk a little bit about Ballast Point. They're one of the, the big boys. They've been around for a while. Um, and to see them 
do some new things it is really cool and I, I really enjoyed those beers really enjoyed the conversation don't forget to check out our give it a try 60 second highlights we have been dropping them on sunday nights but starting this week we're dropping it on monday morning uh so uh, just check out our uh, instagram facebook twitter tiktok youtube pages uh monday morning and we'll have another give it a try 60 second highlight for you also check out all of our social media pages you never know what fun's going to be on there including our monthly giveaways we got some new ones our new one coming up this month details coming soon so don't miss that also check out our friends at one sip beer review near daily beer reviews some fun videos giveaways and just a lot of fun they're at one sip beer review on instagram until next time cheers everyone